She insisted that to understand our ancestors, we must consider their belief systems, which she saw encoded in their art. The Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe, published in 1974, was the beginning of a deep split with her colleagues. I mean, she was very, very well respected until she went into this material. She took a leap of faith by interpreting, saying that she could understand what this was pointing to. And I think that's where, you know, she sort of stepped off the map with, with archaeology, is that she took it into the language of imagery and of uh, mythology and of um, uh, poetry. And this is as far as you could get, really, from the econometric grip of archaeology during the 50s and 60s, where the idea is to excavate a culture, figure out the economic production and relations, and all these artifacts are epiphenomenal, you know, and some kind of religious stuff. I mean, it was the modern economist mentality put onto the excavation. The other thing that makes Maria Gambutas extremely controversial with archaeologists is mythology. Most archaeologists don't have a good background in mythology. Maria Gambutas came into the field with a damn good background in folklore. She'd been out there collecting folk stories in the fields before World War II broke out. Summer was still peaceful in the 1930s when Maria and her sweetheart, Jurgis Gimbutas, wandered the back roads of Zucchia searching for singers of old songs. <laughs> I was interested, of course, in folklore because uh, throughout my high school years I already participated in ethnographical expeditions and I collected folk songs. When I was 16, 17, I collected at least about 5,000 folk songs myself. Even today in Zukia, the ancient songs called Dionos are still sung. The Dionos preserved Lithuania's oral history and culture. Maria described them like the rhythms of a bird, a wedding dance, a lament, a liturgy of nature and the milestones of everyday life. Here, at this point, I start to understand what is the ancient song and what the song was in the very beginning. You, you did everything singing and your song traversed the earth and the woman even working hard was happy because she had the song with her and her belief system was connected to what she expressed in songs. So that stayed with me for, for the whole of life. I was a privileged child. When I have a difficult time now, I go back to my childhood, to abundance of love around me. Maria and her cousin Mele grew up together. Their mothers were sisters, and the households were closely intertwined. <laughs> Mele and her daughter Inga and her granddaughter Usteya are respected scholars and hard-working women in their professions, typical of this remarkable family. Maria and her 
su mokslo doktoru. Te irgi taip pat rodo. Medicinos mokslo doktoru. Taip. Su okulistu medicinos mokslo doktoru. Medicinos mokslo, medicinos moterų. In 1921, when Maria was born, Vilnius was under Polish occupation. The family apartment was the center of her parents' efforts to preserve Lithuanian culture and restore independence. Danielis Alseka was also a doctor. Together they established the first Lithuanian hospital in Vilnius. Ne personali, ne privati, o būtent at visą taligorinę buvo orientuota padėti Vilniaus krašto. Ir štai Marijai šitas tą aplinką, tą dvasę, jį pasiliko visam gyvenimui. My father was so busy, he was out, out all the time. He returned home at night and I, I remember the smoke, he smoked cigarettes and I slipped in, I was sitting on his lap and I also started reading sitting on his lap from newspapers. And this is how I learned to, to read. So that was my father, he was very passionate, loved me very much. My mother was more pragmatic. She was holding everything in her hands. In my childhood, when I was at school, I used to disappear in the city, my beloved city, Vilnius, and go through the courtyards, through the gates, and then visit churches. I loved churches, especially Baroque churches. And they didn't say anything to my parents that I went to the church. <laughs> this was secret. But uh, the connection with churches, with nature, with flowers, with smells, with mushrooms and berries, with animals, I think this was important. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the high school, especially after my father's death when I was 15, it was a terrible shock. It was the beginning of a new Maria interested in death problem. Birth and death, regeneration, afterlife. And then I became a good student. Peace was shattered when the Soviets invaded Lithuania in 1940. At that time, I was writing my dissertation about burial rights. You can imagine the conditions. They started to ship people to Siberia. Out of my own family, about 25 people disappeared. With war raging around them, Maria and Jurgis married. At that time, when I was married, I thought, well, what I did now? <laughs> it was a stupidity because I was not ready to marry, not at all. Well, I was married. And then a child was born in 43. Then the Germans invaded. The German occupation brought something different. Again, they started arrests. So who was not arrested now was arrested. The Germans destroyed Lithuania's once flourishing Jewish community. Then the Soviets came back. So we either escape or we shall be shipped to Siberia. Lithuanians by the hundreds escaped by way of the Nemenis River. The child was small and we were not practical. Because when I, when I fled, I just had my baby in one arm and my dissertation in the other arm and nothing else. At the border, they were offered two choices, Berlin or Vienna. We wanted to go to Vienna. Maria and her family spent the rest of the war as refugees in Austria and Bavaria. 
When peace came, they went to Tübingen in southern Germany. And Tübingen was considered to be one of the best universities and the first university to reopen after the war. I got my PhD degree in two years and my book was published on the burial rites of Lithuania. Then in 47, my second daughter was born. Then started my very good years in that camp, and very good people were around me, and hundreds of babysitters. So I used to take a train back to Tübingen Library, spend days in the library, and my studies began there. I don't say that I finished my studies with a degree. No, I did something else. And so what I did, I returned back to the same, to the folklore studies and to folk art studies, mainly. In 1949, the Gimbutas family, together with Jurgis's mother, were finally able to emigrate to the United States. They went to Boston, where Jurgis found work as an engineer, and Maria was offered an unpaid position at Harvard. I received a letter. If you are serious, you can continue your studies. We shall give you an office here. And if you want to produce a work on prehistory of Eastern Europe, you're welcome. Nobody understands the width and the breadth of information that she brought with her. She had this background of mythology. Then she had all these languages. And then she had uh, her archaeology training, which was rigorous and European. So here I am at Harvard. And this was already 1950, and I knew that I am the only person who knows East European prehistory in the whole United States. There was practically nobody else. And that was my strength. Like so many women, Maria struggled to balance her professional life and her family life as the mother of now three daughters. What I remember of mother she would sit down at the piano and, and play maybe a few times a week. We didn't have a television, and uh, the living room was a place to, to read, to study, and to listen to music. We had lots of company, uh, many interesting uh, writers, intellectual people, so-called intellectuals, <laughs> because my parents belonged to the Lithuanian Cultural Club, which they also led for a few years. Harvard published the prehistory of Eastern Europe, and it was widely read and distributed. Although Maria received no advance or royalties, it established her reputation as an expert in Eastern Europe's deep past. So this was the beginning of my career in America. There was no real chance to stay as a woman at Harvard. I knew that I can stay as a research fellow and lecturer but I probably would never be a professor there. In the 1950s, as a staff member, I couldn't join the faculty club if I went alone, not escorted by men. Also, two libraries were close to women, so that I couldn't, couldn't really stand. I, I, I hated the situation. My relations with my husband, they were also never very wonderful. In 1963, Maria was offered a position at UCLA as a professor. She left her marriage and moved to California. I fell in love with California. I restored my health and I was suddenly happy at UCLA and I felt future in front of me. I was thinking of possibilities, what I should do and what can be created and this was a very good moment. Maria flourished as a professor publishing dozens of academic articles and her fourth book on the Balts. 
1965, her monumental work on the Bronze Age cultures in Central and Eastern Europe was published and brought her international acclaim. From then on, I used to get fellowships. Now, of course, in God's work, I don't get fellowships, no grants, nothing.